And April for us is usually convention time. So a double thanks to Colleen and the US Embassy in Athens for allowing us to recreate the feeling and the atmosphere of our festival through this series of virtual events. And now I would like to ask Ms. Jennifer Suler, cultural at the say of the US Embassy in Athens to address a brief welcome. Well, thank you, Lida. Kalispera sas. I'm really excited to be here today with all of you. Let me start by thanking the Athens Comics Library for their wonderful collaboration in organizing this presentation. Of course, I would also like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Colleen Doran for joining us and for sharing her insights with all of us today. This is a program that, as Lita said, we began planning a year ago, aiming to welcome Colleen to Athens and Thessaloniki for a real life visit. As we all know, the world had other plans for all of us, but we are very fortunate to be able to continue with this initiative by moving it into the virtual space today. Colleen is a celebrated comic creator with many years of experience in the field. And I know we're all looking forward to your presentation, Colleen. I'm also looking forward to learning more about your career in a male dominated industry and hearing about how you've helped to bring female heroines to the forefront of comic storytelling. US President Biden and Vice President Harris have made diversity and inclusion a clear priority for the United States. And the US Embassy here in Greece has been proud to support these priorities with our programs and initiatives. Tonight's discussion is part of a diverse portfolio of programming that we have created to highlight women's voices and empower female professionals. These programs include workshops that provide coding and digital training for women and girls, support female entrepreneurship, and share best practices by connecting American and Greek professionals working on these issues. We are also proud to support programs that bring together creative professionals from the United States and Greece especially this year, as Greece celebrates the 200th anniversary of its War of Independence, the U.S. Embassy is happy to support a series of cultural and educational programs that highlight the strong friendship and close partnership between our two countries and peoples. So I hope that tonight's presentation is one that will both connect and inspire us. Thank you again to Colleen for joining us and to Lida, Dina, and Dimitris of the Athens Comics Library as well as the Thessaloniki Comic Con team for bringing this program to life. Finally, thank you all for joining us. With no further ado, I would like to warmly welcome Colleen Doran uh, to, this, uh, to this session uh, tonight. Colleen, we are very much looking forward to hear your inspiring uh, journey through comics. The floor is yours. Well, Thank you so much. I am pleased and honored and very grateful to be with you here today. I'm so excited that you're interested in comics and are all here today to talk about them. I was asked to be here to discuss my work with you and answer some questions, but I'll also be talking about some of the history of women in comics that might be a little bit obscure that you may not have heard about before and how some of the people I met along the way helped me get to where I am today, because we know we don't do it alone. More importantly, I am gonna take some time to give you some advice that is probably more relevant to how you can break into the comics industry. I got in 40 years ago, that was a long time, the world has changed and the market is very, very different. So I'm gonna take at least a little bit of this discussion to try to give you some advice about what you can do as well that is more current and more relevant to what you need. Um, there are so many people to thank and to remember. If we're high up, it's because other people help lift us up. And it's an incredible privilege to work on great classic characters like Wonder Woman who is such a terrific example to young people all over the world. I hope every day I can be a good example and a better person and a person to live up to the responsibility of working with such a beloved character who represents hope to so many. Thank you so much for being here. I try to infuse my work with life and joy and character and to bring a unique perspective to my approach to comics especially with regard to my storytelling techniques, 
when I'm working on more personal projects. But one of the things I want people to know is that even though I eventually ended up working for some pretty cool clients on big name projects, such as the ones you see here, I didn't come by that via wealth and great privilege. My family was extremely poor, we went hungry, and I did not get to go to an art school for training in art. In fact, such training did not exist in universities when I started out. There's a Wikipedia entry about me that goes on about the schools I went to, but I didn't get to go to art school until I'd been a pro for over 20 years, and all I did was take a beginner digital art class online. The brief time I went to university, it was on scholarship. I majored in business and I left school when the scholarship money ran out. The two art classes I did take were pretty much independent study and I barely spoke to an art teacher. I've had no formal training in art and none in comics at all. Anyone who has, is diligent and wants to take the time and sit down and practice and practice and practice has the chance to make it in comics. One big difference between the comic industry when I got started and the comic book industry world we are in today is comics is now seen as a really cool job that a lot of people want. But when I first got into comics some 40 years ago and I've been a working pro since I was a teenager and I'm now in my mid fifties, back then comics were seen as a lowbrow, low class profession. It was something you did because you couldn't get a good paying job in advertising. And even the great Stan Lee was sometimes embarrassed to admit to people that he wrote comic books. Here's art I drew from Stan Lee's autobiography, Amazing, Fantastic, Incredible Stan Lee, showing one of Stan's memories of this. Even though Stan's old enough to be my grandfather, when I was starting out and in fact, until about the last decade or so, working in comics was just not a cool job. If you were working in comics, it was because you could not get a real job, a real art job, or you were kind of a weirdo. It was extremely unusual for girls to want to work in this business, and none of the cool kids wanted anything to do with it. It was social poison to be seen as a geek or a nerd, and no, almost no one self-identified as a geek. It seems like everyone wants to be called a geek these days, but back then, no one wanted to be seen as braining or nerdy. The first conventions I went to were science fiction conventions, and they were really small. And there were times I'd be one of the few girls at the entire show. And I didn't go to comic book conventions at all until after I became a pro artist. They were not popular, often just a couple hundred people meeting in a hotel. And there were times I was the only girl at the entire show. In some ways, that made it much easier to break in because there were fewer people trying to get in. Now, this was all before the days of the internet. And if you went to a convention to show your portfolio, you might be there with only 20 other artists. Now you go to a big show and there are 2000 artists trying to get seen by an editor. So in some ways, getting attention was much easier when I got started. Of course, without the internet, you had to mail in your art to potential clients or be at a show or go to the publisher's office. There was no Twitter, no deviant art portfolio where people could see your stuff. You had to show it to them in person. But flights used to be so cheap that I could get a $56 ticket, fly to New York City in the morning, deliver my assignments, meet my editor, and fly home in the evening by 7 p.m. And I did that a lot in the 1980s and 1990s. And that helped my career a lot, just fly in and fly back. And I saw, you know, five, six editors that day. Breaking into publishing though, has never really been that hard. I know this sounds hard to believe, but just stick with me for a minute here. I think people confuse the idea of breaking in with getting decent paying work. That's the hard part. There are all kinds of ways to self-publish 
there are web comics, there are blogs. The real trick is staying in and having a paying career. And I've been very lucky to be able to stick it out all this time and work on some exciting projects with wonderful people like Stan Lee and for companies like Marvel and DC and Disney and Lucasfilm. I never dreamed there would be such an amazing scope of opportunity for creators like we have now, such a wide range of possibilities for all kinds of creators. And I love that there are so many books and projects and artists of all kinds, and I feel lucky to still be a part of it. And of course, I've had the great privilege of meeting some amazing, fantastic, incredible people along the way. These are just a few of my recent projects with my favorite writer, Neil Gaiman. And I can now say that after all these years in publishing, I'm doing exactly what I've always wanted to do with my work. That is to carefully pick and choose my projects without having to worry about immediate financial needs or tight deadlines and to cultivate unique styles for each project, taking my time with the art and doing my very best. From where I started out, I didn't think where I ended up was even a realistic possibility. Comics can be a real meat grinder, especially if you're working on a regular web comic or monthly print comic. You have to produce such high volume. I admired Ban Dessiné for many years. Ban Dessiné, you know, European comics, French, Belgian. And I dreamed of being the kind of artist who would be able to lavish my time on a page instead of working on tight deadlines. And being able to work on projects such as the ones you see here is a dream come true for me. So here's a look at some projects that I loved and Chivalry there on the far right isn't even out yet. That won't be out until September. I want to emphasize that while I'm very happy with my life and work and believe I'm incredibly privileged and lucky to be where I am, getting to this point was pretty difficult. The first decade of my career, I was treated pretty badly. I was very poor. I lived below poverty level, and I am extremely grateful to a number of people, including some very powerful people who gave me encouragement and support. I credit them for helping me get through some very bad times. When I first got into the industry, discrimination was very common, but there wasn't any recourse if you were treated badly. You pretty much just had to hope to get a chance to get away from whoever was bad to you and eventually go work for someone who wasn't bad to you. Today, have people have more options to get published and speak out. And there are still things, you know, happening that, uh, that shouldn't be going on. But back then, there wasn't much you could do at all. And there were only a few publishers to choose from. I wanted more than anything to be a cartoonist and I just wasn't going to let anything stop me. But going through bad times would be an understatement and I almost gave up more than once. Bizarrely, many men in the industry at the time didn't think women liked comics, read comics or were good at making comics, especially superheroes. And any information to the contrary was simply ignored. There were plenty of women in comics who believed the same thing. Uh, one well-known woman blogger, when I kept insisting I really liked superheroes, told me that my opinion didn't count because women who liked superheroes were an anomaly and didn't represent real women. Now, it's best to ignore stuff like that and get on doing with what you really want to do, but it's discouraging to hear that when you hear it over and over year after year. It was very common and still is for people to think there were no women in comics in the past. And if there were, they only liked or did romance comics, that there were only a few women creators. And many people mistakenly believe that women have only had a real voice in the sequential art medium during the last decade or so. It's just not true. Some of my greatest artistic influences were women who were making cartoons and comic books over a century ago. And I just wanna give you some historical context here because as I've said, women in comics didn't just appear over the last decade. This is the Bayou Tapestry, a 230 foot long needlepoint cartoon strip depiction 
of the Battle of Hastings. Undoubtedly, the labor on this piece is by women, though there is some debate as to design the work, but it is one of many examples of sequential style art long before comic books came along. You will read many arguments which promote the idea that this culture or that culture invented comics or manga, but every major culture has some representation of early sequential art attempts going back thousands of years in their temples, scrolls, illuminated manuscripts, hieroglyphics, friezes, cave paintings, and sculptures. This is just one example of how universal sequential art storytelling is, and it is a definitive example of how women participated in this art form going back at least 1,000 years. While none of these scrolls or friezes or manuscripts are true comic books, they show how human beings communicate via words and images in ways that attempt to show the passage of time and to manipulate an understanding of space and form in a sequence. This is the essence of comics, even though it is not yet a comic book. Comic books wouldn't truly be created until the invention of cheap pulp printing techniques for mass production centuries later. But the Bayou Tapestry is a proto-comic strip. And I wanna talk for a minute about one of the earliest women comics I never hear get mentioned by anyone. This is Marie Duval. She was the co-creator of Ally Sloper, which was written by her husband, Charles Henry Ross. Marie Duval is one of a number of her pseudonyms. She was, uh, she was actually an actress as well. And she was one of the first professional female cartoonists in all of Europe. She worked in the British penny papers and in comics from the 1860s to the 1880s. She created many inventive page layouts and storytelling techniques that would not be seen in comics again for decades. And her work was collected in book form, a comic book some 60 years before the publication of the first Superman story in action comics, often credited as the first modern comic book. I, I just never see her mentioned in articles about the development of cartoons or the development of the comic book form even though she was quite popular, her work was widely disseminated and it was reprinted in book form, just like Superman newspaper strips were. Duval died when she was in her forties. Her original art seems to have completely disappeared and her name was left off reprintings of her work, effectively wiping her from history. But you can learn more about her by visiting the website marieduval.org. For centuries, women artists were considered a rarity and generally inferior in skill to men. Women were forbidden to receive the same training in arts as men as it was believed that the study of the human body would make women immodest. They were excluded from anatomy classes. In the late 1800s to early 1900s, these attitudes began to change and working girls were actively encouraged to study art as a vocation, decorative and illustration art was seen as a healthy job prospect for women and girls, as fine art was considered beyond their abilities. Ads like this one that encouraged girls to take commercial art classes popped up in newspapers around this time. And during the golden age of illustration from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, a number of women illustrators and cartoonists rose to prominence, such as Jessie Wilcox Smith, Violet Oakley, and Beatrix Potter. During the golden age of illustration, um, Howard Pyle is widely credited as creating an entire school of American art known as the Brandywine School, and he was greatly admired by artists such as Vincent Van Gogh. He was one of the first a men to allow women creators to attend his art classes and many of the most prominent of these illustrators of the time came from this school, including Smith, Oakley and Elizabeth Shippen Green. You're looking at Jesse Wilcox Smith there on the left and Beatrix Potter on the right. However, despite his progressive moves, Pyle later decided that women entering an art career harmed them because it interfered with their prospects of marriage and home life. 
And now we get to talk about my idol. This is Rose O'Neill. One of the things that drives me crazy <laughs> is today I run into uh, people who claim that women have never experienced discrimination in the arts. This is a 1915 quote by Rose O'Neill. I have a thrilling hope that women are going to do something glorious in the arts. It is my passionate conviction. I'm always indignant when women are denied creative power in art. Women have spoken out about how they've been shunted aside for centuries uh, from picture making, from, from the creative community. And Rose O'Neill was one of the most successful and powerful illustrators of her day. I first learned about her when I was a kid, when I, when I read uh, Maurice Horn's World Encyclopedia of Comics at my local library. I noticed there weren't many women in this book. And I also noticed that no matter how well they drew, and Rose O'Neill drew better than most, the women were almost always written off in dismissive terms. After reading about her, I tracked down everything I could find about her and was amazed at her incredible talent and massive success. She was a cartoonist and illustrator, but she was also a fine artist, a painter, a sculptor, and she had worldwide success with her creation of her franchise, The Cupies, one of the first licensing of a cartoon in franchise history. This made her a millionaire. You can see her designs for the patent of her Cupid doll co-credited to her sister Callista on the right of this image. Her career began at age 13 when she entered a contest with the winning drawing being so well conceived that the judges had a hard time she'd actually done it. So they made her sit down and do another while they watched. She was immensely successful and popular, was able to travel the world studying art and sculpture in Paris with Rodin, and she was elected to the Société Coloniale des Artistes Francois in 1921 and had exhibitions of her sculptures at the Galerie de Vembe in Paris and the Wildenstein Galleries in New York. I was offended on behalf of Rose O'Neill that so many contemporary scholars dismissed the scope of her work as merely cute. She became my idol, and every time someone told me that women couldn't be successful in comics, I thought of her. Another of my idols is Ethel Hayes, creator of the strip Flapper Fanny. Hayes was primarily known for her comic strips, but she was also a well-regarded children's book illustrator, and her career lasted for decades. She died at age 97. While neither Hayes nor O'Neill worked in comic books, they both drew so beautifully and were so successful before modern comic books even existed that I wanted to bring something of the style and elegance of their era and their success with me into my comic book world. Their excellent examples of skill and career scope shaped my career choices. Like O'Neill, I started in commercial art when I was a teenager, landing my first job for an advertising agency when I was about 14 or 15. The lady who hired me, Linda Wesley, says I was 14, but I honestly don't know because I can't remember back that far. Regardless, I had no idea that there was a mindset among many that women could not and should not work in comics. You can see that women did and always have done so. It wasn't until years later that I came to understand that in the mid 1950s, when superhero comics came to dominate the market, comic book publishers focused entirely on producing work of interest to young boys. Now this didn't deter me in the least because I loved superheroes, but more and more over time, owing to cultural and economic factors that are not really the scope of this talk, Superheroes were targeted less at general audiences and more at boys and young male adults. Most women and girls stop consuming comic books and the idea that women don't read or work in comics took hold. And when I was first starting out as a pro, even though I was already getting published by major clients, the situation I was in was very discouraging and I felt that many of the jobs I was getting were tokenizing and stereotyping. It was limiting because there just wasn't much of a market for you if you got stuck with the girl cartoonist label. 
Now, I got into comics because I loved superheroes, but I was annoyed that the U.S. market was so limited in its outlook about what comics could be. I was introduced to manga by underground comics artist Leslie Sternberg, who told me she thought they reminded her of my work. Now, most of the shoujo manga people feel must have influenced my art were not even published when I first developed my comic style. So any resemblance you may see there did not originally come from manga. Manga was not at all popular or widely available in the USA when I was a girl. However, I learned from Fred Schott's book, Manga, Manga, The World of Japanese Comics, which I think I first saw sometime around 1985, that there was a robust market for comics created by women and girls in Japan, even though we were being told in the USA that such a thing could not exist. While I don't consider manga to be a major influence on my art in general, with most of the things people see in my projects that resemble you know, manga that's actually coming from Western resources, knowing that there was a market out there for women and girls was inspiring. And this is The Rose of Versailles by Ryoke Ikeda. And this is from 1973. I didn't see this until around 1984 and 1985, but I was totally hooked by it. I loved this book. And all that may seem like an odd detour, but when I was first starting in comics and things weren't so encouraging, knowing a broader history of comics and women's contributions to the medium helped me stick to my guns. And now I get to draw cool things like this, which is my original pen and ink art for DC Comics Generations Forged. Uh, this just came out, by the way. I, I wanted to just take some time to talk to you about how I got from here to there. And I didn't do any of this in my career without a long history of women in comics who came before me. And I think it's important to thank those who paved the way, some of whom are written out of history. And <laughs> we've all got to start somewhere. And this is fanzine art I did <laughs> for a Dungeons and Dragons fanzine when I was around, I don't know, 13 years old, maybe. Uh, you'd think by then I'd have learned how to draw panel borders. This is really terrible. I'm sure your eyes are bleeding. Let's move along quickly. <laughs> now, this was my first professional comics assignment. This was uh, Miss Fury. Um, it was created as a comic strip in 1941 by artist June Tarp Mills and um, a gentleman named Tom Long who did a uh, small press publication called Graphic Showcase, something he started in the 1960s, uh, wanted to revive the strip and this was some of my art for it. Uh, he discovered some great comics creators like Bernie Wrightson, Mike Kaluta, and uh, science fiction illustrators like Steve Hickman. Now, by today's professional standards, I think Graphic Showcase would have, uh, well, by the standards of the day, Graphic Showcase would have been considered by a, to be a fanzine. By today's standards, it would be considered a professional publication, and I was paid for my work there, um, but it, uh, it never came out because it was, it was too adult for me and I had to quit. But um, I was discovered at a convention. I would bring my portfolio, I put my art up in shows and a number of people saw my stuff and they started trying to give me jobs. Um, this was the villainous for the story. I don't have the rest of the art. I don't know what happened to it, but this was some of my first work. And just, this is just a year or so later, I think you can see a big improvement in the art, but uh, you can also see a, a big mistake that a lot of new creators make. And that is the reason this page looks so much better is because I would spend days or weeks picking at it. And some of my very early work looks a lot better than some of my later work because I was spending so much time on it. As a professional, uh, you don't get days or weeks to work on a single page. Um, there are so many uh, cases when creators come to you with fantastic page samples. You think, wow, I'm gonna hire this person. And then under pressure or on deadline, the art doesn't look so good. And I figured out pretty early on this was gonna be a problem. 
and tried to change my approach. And one big advantage that I had was I had story pages like this. The biggest mistake we see over and over and over again in newbie portfolios is it's just pinup after pinup after pinup. People standing there, cute character designs, that sort of thing. You need to have continuity. You need to have storytelling. I would say nine out of 10 portfolios that we see do not have basic storytelling skills on display. Uh, if you don't have that, you're, you're not going to be able to get a job. And this is a fur further illustration of how realist, unrealistic my early expectations are. Uh, this is some of my earliest professional comics work. It took me a week to do this page. <laughs> um, not good. Uh, I was getting something like a dollar an hour. <laughs> And the public is generally unwilling to wait for comic books that are only done at the rate of a page a week. Uh, it's very unrealistic expectation and um, a, lot of, a lot of newbies don't understand this, but uh, the artwork looks nice. It's, it's very pretty, it's highly rendered, but uh, you can't make a career out of this unless you're willing to find someone who's willing to pay you a lot of money so that you can spend an entire week working on a single page. Now, uh, there's only about one or two years between the last slide and this page. Uh, this, this is actually earlier than the last slide, but it was one of my first early attempts at superhero comic style inking and trying to learn to draw within realistic comic book deadlines. One thing I did um, that you should all do, especially if you're starting out, is keep a time record of your productivity. Um, I would record the amount of time it took me to do a page in the corner of every page to see if I could make deadlines. Now, here I am trying to draw like John Byrne and my lettering and everything is terrible. Um, this is another big mistake that newbies make. Do not letter your own stuff unless you're good at it. Uh, it really brings your art down even if you draw well. Um, and in fact, on a lot of my earlier pages, like the, well, which page was it? Let's see. This page before, when I realized my big mistake of lettering my own stuff, I went back and erased it. But of course, this is an ink and I couldn't do that. Um, most people aren't very good at digital lettering either. If it's not something you really need to have in your portfolio as samples, don't do it. There's a reason there are professional letterers. They make a huge difference. Uh, I think it was about 17, 18, maybe when I drew this. Um, I, I, it's not too bad for a kid, but the lettering is terrible. I had no idea what it was doing. Leave the lettering off unless you're going to be a letterer. And here is my work over a decade later, getting to draw those characters in a professional publication for Marvel Comics. This was for Mutant X. As you can see, there's something of an improvement here. Uh, these are my uninked pencils. And um, some people get upset when I complain about this, but a big impediment to my early career was that I was working on tight deadlines most of the time, not getting to do my best stuff. And um, this is tight penciling, very clean, but there's what you draw, and there's what makes it to publication. And one of the things that's going to hold you back is if you don't get a good inker. About 20 years ago, I stopped working with inkers entirely because usually only the A-list artists were getting the good inkers. And if you weren't A-list, God only knows what your work was gonna look like when it made it to publication. Um, you're, you're really, not going to shine uh, in most of your early assignments because you get the fill-ins, you get the hard jobs. It's, it's really very rare when I was starting out for, for a newbie like me to get, to get a, a plum treatment. You, you see publishers giving new creators star treatment right out the gate. That rarely happened when I was a kid. So, um, so yeah. Um, if you're not going to ink your own stuff, if you're not good at it and your pencils are solid, don't ink at all. But if you do ink your own stuff, 
keep copies of your pencil art as well as copies of your ink art in your portfolio show you can show publishers what you're capable of and what the before and after look like you never know you may end up uh, getting jobs as an inker even if you don't get jobs as a penciler and i want to take a minute to to talk about some of the people who were very influential and very helpful to me this is the cover of queen's album news of the world spy artist and illustrator frank kelly freeze he was my mentor when i was growing up and um, I certainly went through some experiences where people told me to just give it up and I was never going to be any good and whatever, but Frank Kelly Fraze was the Dean of Science Fiction Artists. He won more Hugo Awards than any other artist at the time. I'm not sure what the situation is now, but Kelly was universally beloved and he was unwaveringly supportive of my work and my career early on. And uh, that made an enormous, enormous difference in uh, my ability to stick it out. Um, when you have somebody you don't respect and who you don't think is a very good artist telling you you stink and you should go get a day job, and you have somebody like Frank Kelly Freeze telling you you've, you've got the chops and stick with it, uh, that's, that's big. So. Frank Kelly Freeze, go look him up. He's just a wonderful, wonderful man. You might recognize his work from Mad Magazine. He did uh, did a lot of pictures of the character Alfred E. Newman, the guy with the big ears on the cover of Mad. Um, he was such a big supporter of my work. And this is some of my earliest work, a uh, series I created, uh, wrote and drew, uh, even do, <laughs> do everything on this thing, including the lettering by hand. I, I just had some epic, awful experiences starting out and he would have me come over to his house and we'd just talk for hours. Uh, my early experiences on this were so bad that I took all of the original art from a previous edition of it that I could find and I burned it. Uh, <laughs> I think I just read Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, but it felt great to rise from the ashes and I'm still working on this project to this day. I first created the characters and concepts when I was about 12 years old and it's in multiple printings and editions now, and it's published by Shadowline Comics, an imprint of Image Comics. And one of the first people to see art for this was Frank Kelly Freeze. So thank you, Kelly. And this is another one of my uh, great um, uh, inspirations and uh, early supporters. This is Keith Giffen. Um, when I was about 17 years old, I was working on a fanzine uh, called Interlac. It was actually called an Ampazine, but nobody knows what they are anymore. And I can be here all day explaining it. Uh, we'll just call it a fanzine. And they have really low circulation, maybe about 100 copies. But of those 100 copies, uh, maybe a dozen or so would go to professionals at the comic book companies. And Keith Giffen was one of the people who got the zine. And he saw my work in it. And this elements uh, piece over there is some of my work from that zine. And he called me up on the phone because back then we were, you know, we were just, it was a very different world. You put your phone and your, your address in these zines and hope that people would contact you and you, you like would never do that now but uh he called me up on the phone and got my mom and <laughs> Keith's like oh, can I speak to Colleen Dorn and mom is like oh well she's at school <laughs> Keith's like what she's a kid but he called me up and asked me if I'd like to audition to draw the Legion of Superheroes and uh, because I'm an idiot, I actually turned down that opportunity because I was, I was actually afraid of, of it. And I had already agreed to do a job for a small press. Boy, was that a big mistake. But um, um, this is another example of an established pro going out of his way to help a kid. We are still friends. <sighs> decades later and we still work together I consider him one of the best friends I've ever had and all because one day he saw a kid's work and said I want to hire that kid and picked up the phone so, pretty cool um this is some of the work I do on a distant soil this is fairly recent work um 
most of my work on it is by hand. This cover over here on the right is some of my earliest digital work. And it's the first of distant soil cover I did by hand. But the lettering and all of the line work you see there on the left, that's all by hand. Um, I don't know why I'm still doing it all by hand at this point. It's kind of, I don't know, neurotic, I guess. But because I did learn by hand, in some ways, um, sticking to drawing it by hand is faster than digital. You, you just get so used to be, being able to do these things and you, you've either got the hand-eye coordination or you don't, you don't need the computer to clean up your line or whatever. I don't consider myself a good letterer, even though that all that lettering is by hand. And when I don't like my lettering, sometimes I go in with the computer and tweak it. But okay, make a long story short, this series pretty much launched my career in the small press. And from there, I went to DC Comics. I definitely rethought the uh, mistake of not taking up that Legion of Superheroes audition. And some of my earliest work at DC Comics ended up being Legion of Superheroes work. And I got to eventually work on cool projects like this with nice Mr. Stanley. And uh, now we're going to take some time to talk about breaking in. I mean, we've talked about how I broke in, but it's probably not very relevant to how you broke in. And um, one of the most important things you have to have if you're trying to break into the mainstream is samples, pages that actually show the mainstream characters. It's, it's quite odd that I see a lot of samples from people when, you know, I want to work for Marvel, I want to work for DC. Marvel and DC is really interested in seeing what you do with their property. So you need to have some of those samples in your portfolio. You need to target your portfolio to the client. And again, like not having any continuity in your portfolio, nine times out of 10, I see portfolios that just don't seem to have any focus at all. I don't, I don't know what the stuff is in there, but they're not targeted for the client. One of the things I used to do when I would make the rounds in New York is I would have chunks of my portfolio separated so that every time I went to a different client, I would have different samples to show a particular client. I'd go to Marvel with certain samples and DC with certain samples and another publisher with certain samples. And I remember going to DC one day and, you know, I had the scattershot portfolio art in there and the DC art director really read me the riot act. And I thought about what he'd said. I mean, it was pretty harsh. And I was like, okay, so I rearranged the stuff in my portfolio. I went right to Marvel and I got a job at Marvel that day because the DC editor gave me a lousy art review. And I said, you know what? He's probably right. This, 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 I don't need to be showing an editor this stuff. I need to be more careful what I show. Went over to Marvel, got a job that day. So think about what you're showing and to whom you're showing it. And this is a small portion of my uh, lecture about how to break in comics. Um, there, there are two things you need to ask yourself. Do you really want to be a professional? I mean, is this what you want to do for a living? Um, and do you really have anything to say to the public or do you just like the write and draw? Fact of the matter is if all you want to do is just write and draw and you just want to enjoy it and you just want to create, that's fine. You go do that. There are plenty of venues for you to do that. You do not need to make money at art to be an artist. You just need to make art. But to be a professional artist, you do have to think about uh, whether or not you're going to be able to make a living at it. Um, and you need to ask yourself these questions. What do I have to say? Is this a hobby or a profession? Do I need to make a profit or just get my investment returned? Should I just post it on a blog or you know, make a web comic and let people see it and I don't have to worry about making any money? And do you actually need to be in print? Do you actually need to have a book in your hand? Ask yourself those questions when you're sitting down deciding what you want your path to be. 
Now, I spent many years in self-publishing and self-publishing is a great way to get your, your foot in the door. Um, putting your stuff on a blog is self-publishing. Putting your stuff on a web comic is self-publishing. These are all legit venues for publishing. Anybody that says you haven't been published, if you put your stuff on a website or a blog, that's not true. You have been published. But self-publishing really isn't that easy. Um, you do get to keep all of the money that comes in, but you also have to pay all of the expenses. And there are more expenses than you might think. You have to provide your own financial, legal, production, and promotion support or pay someone else to do so. This can end up being almost as expensive as getting a publisher, except you had to do all of the labor as well, and you may not have the expertise to do that labor well. Now, there's always print on demand. You want to see your work in print. Print on demand is great. You just print one book at a time. You don't have to carry an inventory. You can just, you know, maybe print a dozen to test your market. Okay. This really reduces your risk. This is a great way to get your book into print and get it into the hands of uh, fans at a show. So you've got a table at a convention or maybe you want to um, uh, show some samples uh, when you go to a show. Oops, you know, do that. Um, this may, however, turn off traditional publishers. If you decide to show them your sample in print, they'll go, well, this has already been published. We don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So you might want to uh, consider whether showing that as uh, a published work to a potential client, you, you might want to think twice about that, but uh, whatever, just if, if you're worried about that as a, as a uh, impediment, just say, these are one of a dozen copies I printed as a sample. Now, a publishing deal can be a real nightmare, and I've had a few, but if it goes well, honestly, if my publishing deals continue to go as well as some of my publishing deals have lately, I'll never self-publish again. Upfront financial support. I don't have to come up with all that money, yay. Invaluable editorial assistant. Um, no one has complained about editors more than I have over the years, but a good editor is priceless. Uh, a marketing team, a promotioning team, legal support, somebody else handling your copyright and trademark issues, yay. Foreign publishing support, hot diggity and access to licensors and film agents. That's really hard to do when you're just doing your own thing and self-publishing. And of course, by self-publishing, I mean also uh, raising money by Kickstarter and other crowdfunding. I raise money on my Patreon by crowdfunding. So yeah, but um, uh, these are all great things that go along with getting a publisher. And if you can bring in the money, you can get a good deal but most books don't bring in the money. 93% of books sell less than 1,000 copies. Most small press or self-published books never move more than a few hundred copies. 9% of book orders account for 80% of all book sales. The entire publishing market is supported by less than about 5% of the authors. And virtually everything not produced by this small elite loses money. It's your job to prove to the client that you have a book that will sell. And almost all publishing money is in the backlist. When I say backlist, I mean a book that's been in print for a long time. Watchmen was printed in the 1980s. It's still in print and making money now. Sandman was printed in the 1990s. It's still in print and making money now. Evergreens or perennials, as those books are known, 
bring in new money year after year with little subsequent investment. And these books support the prime authors, but they also subsidize the search for new authors. So sometimes we get resentful seeing somebody like Stephen King or uh, Neil Gaiman or you know one of these huge authors getting all the attention. Well, that money is partly invested in new authors. Now, after going over all the benefits of having a publisher, do you actually need one? And that to publish, that depends entirely on what you want. A publisher can help establish your brand. If you get a series at Marvel or DC, for example, you are automatically getting seen by many, many people. However, Many a mainstream creator has decided to self-publish and then failed miserably just because people are willing to buy your mainstream book and say 40,000 people buy your mainstream comic. That doesn't mean 40,000 people are going to buy the thing that you self-publish later. The self-publishing comics movement created a handful of successes but left countless cartoonists in debt now, crowdfunding helps out a lot with that these days. You know, if you don't reach your target, you don't necessarily produce your book. And publishing on the web is not entirely free. There are expenses to consider. And being popular on the web doesn't always translate to money. Sometimes it does. You can see people who've really not done very many books and have certainly never done very many books, but they've got a great big following on Instagram and boom, they raise a lot of money on Kickstarter. You never know, but other people, you just don't know. But these are, these are not rules. These are just things to consider when you're thinking about how you want to take your career and how you want to break in. The independent press is a great way to reach focused, enthusiastic readers, but not such a great place to make a living. And mainstream publishers like Marvel and DC pay solid page rates, but rarely allow creators to retain rights to their work. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't get about working in the small press is that the time cost of the creation of the work is usually not returned even if the book makes money. If you spent three weeks working on a book and you profited, you know, a thousand dollars because you got a hundred dollar a page rate on your 10 pages, you only got paid a thousand dollars for three weeks of work. That's not a whole lot of money. I mean, it's better than nothing but you probably would have made more money doing something else. That is one of the hard things to face about being independent and working in the small press and hoping that eventually you will be able to break through and reach a wider audience, which by the way, did happen to me, but a lot of people can't stick it out for the long haul. And to be perfectly honest, my, you know, as I mentioned before, my first 10 years of working as a published creator, working on some very popular books, including my, my small press book, A Distant Soil, it sold as many as 40,000 copies, but I was generally making uh, just a few thousand dollars a year. Uh, you need to understand that no matter where you're gonna work, whether you're working for yourself or you're working for other people. Self-publishing does not mean that you are isolated from the rules and responsibilities of being a business person. You work with lots of people. You work with vendors, advertisers, licensors, et cetera. And this applies to all creative people, no matter what. You are a key person business. This is the riskiest kind of business because everything depends on one person, you, your ability to function. 
um, if anything happens to your ability to keep producing, uh, the gravy train is off. If you don't have a backlist, and this is super important, the backlist will cover those times when you, the key person business, is not able to be productive. Uh, if I've got royalties coming in from say Sandman, for example, and I'm sick that month, that is how I make a living because creative people don't get paid when they don't produce unless you've got books earning royalties. And very, very important, everything you do is about one-on-one -on -one customer service. I don't mean necessarily with each and every person who buys your book, but I do mean with each and every client, every editor, every publisher, every assistant editor, your, your fellow creators, you are a business being represented by how you behave and interact with other people. And your ability to do this makes a difference. And I hate to say it, but if you are a woman or a person of color, how you behave is going to be counted against you more than it might be for certain other people. Um, a lot will be expected of you. And anything you do that can be used against you will be used against other creators like you. Let's just call that out. Um, <clears throat> and meeting clients applies even when you work, it rules about meeting clients applies even when you work for yourself. Keep your greetings polite. There are so many people that think that being snarky or uh, using put down humor or negging is going to get them remembered. It will get you remembered for all the wrong reasons. Know who you're dealing with. Research your potential clients or contracts in advance. Um, just going, wow, I want to work for Marvel Comics or wow, I want to work for DC. That's not enough. You need to target the specific editor and the specific editor's line really know, don't just say, I want to work on Spider-Man, really know that product. The more depth of understanding you have of the product line, whatever it is, the better you're going to increase your chances of stay, getting in and staying in. Know the staff. Do not dismiss the flunkies, the secretary, the receptionist, the accounting people, do not do that. They work just as hard as you do and don't dismiss anybody just because they're not at the top of the food chain. This is a really important tip. Editors get all the attention, but assistant editors are easier to reach. Target the assistant editor. The big main editor is concentrating on the meat and potatoes. But the assistant editor is dealing with the scrum. You target that assistant editor. Be polite to that assistant editor. Treat them like the professional they are. They will remember that and appreciate it because a lot of people don't do that. They treat them like they're disposable. And this is really, and the second one is so important. Don't act as if you want something. Everyone knows you want something. Everyone knows you want to get published. When you go to a client and it's all about me, 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 well, the client just saw 2,000 other people going me, 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 me. The client wants to know what you can do for them. Are you going to be able to make that client money? Are you going to make that client look good? That is what they want. Know the client know their product and know that they are there to make a buck. And they want to know that you are going to make that money for them. Emailing, this sounds so basic, but you would not believe the emails some of us professionals get from people who say they want to work with us or want to collaborate. Some of these emails are so rude, 
uh, I, you know, my jaw is on the floor that people think that I would actually want to work with them after I get this in my mailbox. Be warm, don't, you don't have to be effusive, but just be warm and polite. Be more polite than if you were meeting them in person because type is cold. Warm up your query. Do not do this on social media. Please don't do this on social media. Many uh, people will block you if you try to solicit uh, work to them on social media. They will just flat out block you. Don't deluge artists and writers and editors, for example, with requests for attention or aid. You may not get blocked, but you will probably get muted. And to be perfectly frank, a lot of us have assistants who are going through our social media to weed stuff out for us so that we don't see it there. That's the truth. Do not ever post unsolicited work on a professional social media wall. It doesn't, that doesn't mean fan art. It's like, oh, I really loved your, you know, Wonder Woman. Here's my Wonder Woman. You go, yay, that's great. But if you're coming to me with a script or a story, we can't read it. Creators can't read that stuff. That's what editors are for. We are often warned by our lawyers not to read unsolicited work. I only read stuff if, if I have a strong level of trust with someone. I won't read anything by a new creator, period. I'm not going to do it. Um, if you want to get published, you're probably not going to get published through another creator anyway. That is what editors are for. Go to an editor. If a professional's page is private, look, there's a typo. I need an editor already. If a professional's page is private, do not request to join and don't become belligerent if refused. This is social poison within the professional community. You will be blocked. Do participate in online discussions. This helps us to get an idea of your character and attitude. I've befriended people I've met online, been friends with them for many years now, and I've hired people I've met online. But I got a chance to see how they behave, and I got a chance to see their work in their space, and I approached them. Don't spend too much time on message boards and other high drama social media. It used to be standard advice to spend a lot of time on message boards and stuff, but more and more pros are looking at that with a wary eye. Um, social media can get you in a lot of trouble. The wrong, the wrong thing said, um, you know, the wrong thing liked, blah, blah, blah. Boy, it's a minefield out there. Be wary of your behavior. And I don't mean you need to not be yourself, but maybe it's a good idea not to perform for an audience and then regret it later. Let's just put it that way. Uh, the internet is great and can bring lots of eyes to you, but the internet is also bad and can be bringing lots of eyes to you and that kind of pressure can cripple people. I've seen young artists give up because they got reamed out on Tumblr. Um, it's, it's really rough out there. So um, I, I cannot tell you uh, exactly what to say. I'm not gonna tell you what to draw. I'm just giving you the warning that um, for many years, the comics industry was mostly about nerds um, with their little clubs and hanging out together. And it was you and 24 people. And now it's you and 240,000 people. And that can get really, really ugly. Um, it's celebrity culture now. And there are times I don't like it anymore. So be aware that other people's behavior toward you and your art can lift you up and it can tear you down just as quickly. And 
you need to have a very strong center. You need to know what you want and you need to create strong boundaries. Know that what you do online is your professional space and the sort of thing you want to be known for. How, how do you want to be known for? Think about what you said and what you did and how you behaved. Think about it in 20 years. Mm. Um, just think. Okay. Online portfolios, uh, like at Twitter, the visible women hashtag, et cetera, these are great places to be seen. I've sent many clients uh, looking for artists to these resources. Several people that I've sent that way have gotten jobs. These are really great ways to get jobs. Please do take advantage of them. But again, with the sweet comes the sour, be prepared. Uh, work for hire. A lot of people ask me about work for hire. Uh, work for hire is generally what you sign when you go to work for uh, Marvel or DC. Uh, you don't get any rights to your stuff. Let's just call it out. You don't get any rights to your stuff. If I work on Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman is owned by DC Comics. I mean, I shouldn't own Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman doesn't belong to me. Depending on the circumstances, these contracts can actually work out in your favor. I've made more money in some cases on work for hire assignments than I have on stuff on which I owned everything. Depending on the contract, this can be very lucrative and fair. And I know some creators who had the great fortune to have created something back in the 1980s when the contracts were even better than they are now. And that material ended up making it into a movie and they ended up getting nice fat six figure checks. So you never know. Um, but work for hire, um, work for hire is something that I tolerate because I also have plenty of stuff I own. If, if it was just work for hire for me, I probably wouldn't enjoy it very much. Have a little of both, just my advice. Um, and this is part of why work for hire is not so great. Uh, work for hire makes you an employee for purposes of all copyright law. Well, what does that mean? It means you're not the author. Technically, you didn't do it. The company did. Uh, they can do anything with your art that they like. Okay, fair enough. Um, but you get absolutely nothing on the back end. There are no employee benefits. There are no, uh, there, there's no back end, no nothing. Now, sometimes if you are a more powerful creator, you can get some of that stuff included in your contract, but in general, that's all you get. And uh, I, you know, in Europe, things are different. You, you tend to have uh, national healthcare out there here in the United States, we don't have it. I don't get it in any of my contracts. My healthcare alone costs me five figures a year. I have to be a successful creator in order to pay for that. So um, work for hire has its benefits. You get to work on cool things like Wonder Woman and Spider-Man and Captain America, and it has its drawbacks. Just be aware of what the situation is. Now book publishing deals are a different matter. Graphic novel book publishing deals through traditional publishing houses are the same as prose publishing deals with all the same rights retained for the creator. When you work for a comic book publisher, a lot of them have Byzantine licensing agreements and uh, they take a chunk of your movie and TV rights and they try to get your trademark and yada, yada, yada. In book publishing, well, that's not necessarily the case. You know, these things can be very complicated. I would never again try to negotiate a book publisher without an agent, and I have one. But uh, in book publishing, you're considered an author, and a lot of times in comics, you're considered kind of the you know problem child hired hand. So. <laughs> Uh, book publishing deals give you a little bit more uh, presumption of authorship than comic book deals do. Um, there are also book packagers. Um, 
these things can be really rough. What happens with some of these book, pa book packagers is they try to build a team and sell the project with this team to a larger client and they have you doing work for hire deals on stuff that shouldn't have been work for hire in the first place. So uh, basically you've got this packager that acts like a mainstream comics publisher, but they take your graphic novel package to a, a mainstream book publisher, a prose book publisher and treat you like a work for hire deal when you should have been getting a standard book publishing deal. It's these these can be really, really nasty. You need to be careful of book packagers. I've run into a number of these. A lot of people come to me out of the woodwork and it's like, oh, we're looking to book together this project and and I'll only get such a cut of the deal. And I'm like, you you shouldn't be getting a cut of the deal at all. I can make I can make that deal on my own. And I uh, it just just really, really awful deals. I do not love them. Your mileage may vary, but um, when they're taking all your rights as well as a percentage of royalties, I don't see any benefit here. Um, you also need a lawyer, uh, but one of the biggest mistakes I see creators make is they don't get an industry specialist. I see so many people, they end up just getting a lawyer who's in their town, someone they know. Um, no, you need you need somebody with experience in a particular area. There are not that many lawyers who specialize in comics. Uh, Mike Lovitz of Lovitz IP Law is one of them, but um, uh, way too many people getting their real estate attorney or whatever to negotiate their deals. And all areas of law are different, and you need to have a specialist. Your lawyer should not be acting as your agent. That's a conflict of interest. I know several people who have made this mistake and the lawyer ends up getting a percentage and makes deals that benefit the lawyer more than they benefit the creator. Be careful. These are the things you want. You want your copyright, you want your trademark, you want a solid cut of the licensing, a cut of the film, and well, you want your film and TV rights. If you can keep them separate and negotiate them later, that's better. But if you can't, you want to make sure you get a big fat percentage of that. Um, you want to make sure that on any licensing deal, the the publisher or the agency doesn't turn around and sell your deal to another area of that agency and then take a cut for selling to themselves. This happens a lot. You want limits on first refusal. First refusal is, um, boy, how do I put this? First refusal, the publisher has the right to first look at your next job, fair enough, but you need to be able to limit their ability to hold up on that. You give them 30 days and if they haven't accepted in 30 days, you're done. You also need very clear terms on termination. I've gotten into some, public, uh, some trouble in the past with publishers where the terms of termination were clear to everybody but the publisher, they broke the contract and they didn't wanna let me out of the deal. You need to be very, very clear on that transparent accounting practices. You need to be able to audit the books, no cross collateralization, royalties against one book counted against royalties against another. If one book is losing money and the other book is making money, you wanna make sure they don't combine the accounting so that you're able to make money even if this book lost money. Clear marketing and promotion terms. There's absolutely no reason to go with a publisher if they're just going to let your book sit there on a shelf and they're not going to promote it and market it, you need, to, you need to try to get some of that down on paper. You need enough money, enough of an advance or a page rate to do the job in the first place. So many of these publishers give you so little out the gate that you are just starving while you're working on the book. This is a disaster. Actually, made a bad deal. I don't know, it was about six or seven years ago. Well, maybe it was longer than that. And I was like, I had to go back in and renegotiate because it was like, there just isn't enough money to do this job. A decent royalty cut rate, that's, that's going to vary. Um, 
Uh, things have changed a lot in publishing over the last few years. I don't think uh, deals are as good as they used to be, but this is a big one. Limits on cuts on royalties for discounted books. If the publisher is gonna be selling your book wholesale and letting it fly out the door, uh, you need to be able to put a cap on that. And you also, let me see if it's on my next one, it's not here. Uh, you also need to make sure that they offer the, those same deals to you. If they're gonna be selling your book at 80% off to a wholesaler, well, why don't they let you buy your book 80% off so that you can have those copies to take to a show with you and make some money? I have made six figures buying some of my own inventory from my publisher and, and reselling it at personal appearances. So you wanna do that, that's a, that's a good one. That's a tip I got from Harlan Ellison, by the way, never forget it. Um, comic book publishing deals are complex, but book publishing deals these days are, oh my gosh, you really, really need an agent for this. Um, you need to be looking online for a list of agents if you can find one and there aren't that many with experience in comics as well, then who's ah? But uh, I've been in this job for 40 years and I run into stuff I can't understand, especially foreign licensing deals. You need somebody to help you out. I, I know they take a cut, but believe me, you, you will be treated a lot worse if you don't have somebody looking out for you. <laughs> the trademark can be even more important than your copyright. The trademark is the logo, the title of your book, the design of your characters, the names of your characters. A lot of publishers will try to tell you that uh, you don't need that and they're lying. Um, if someone is going to try to get you to give up your trademark, they need to pay you and they need to pay you well for it. Be very, very careful dealing with anyone who tries to tell you to give up your trademark on anything you created yourself. <coughs> so if publishing is so complex and difficult and hard, why would you bother? Well, I self-published for many years and a good relationship with a top quality publisher is better than self-publishing, no doubt. Um, the re reason why all of these people in the food chain get a cut is because they worked for it and they earned it. And it would be churlish to say that I get everything myself because I do everything and I'm the fountainhead. Well, fact of the matter is I'm not very good at marketing or distribution or getting my books into stores or what other people are good at that. They deserve to get paid for it. Almost every single top writer continues to work with a publisher, even though they could make more money self-publishing. The mess and stress that goes along with self-publishing, uh, in my experience, can outweigh the advantage uh, uh, outweigh the disadvantages of working for a major publisher. I do a little bit of both. This keeps me happy. So you may wanna consider that. Um, a bad publisher is the absolute worst experience ever. Uh, they, they will strangle your creations in the crib, but a good publisher is like seeing your kid grow up, get a scholarship to Harvard, and then get a seven figure job. Um, so I don't know how long this lasts. I'm not even looking at the clock. I, uh, <laughs> we still got time here. I'm gonna show you some of my art and stuff. With any luck, after all that, after all that advice, I hope it was helpful. I hope you go off into the sunset with many happy creative years behind you. And if we've got a little bit more time, here's a portfolio of some of my comic book pages. Again, if you wanna work for Marvel or DC, Show them their own characters. Let them know you're able to work within their milieu. Um, here, here's something I wanted. Here's another note I made to myself. Um, this is important. I, I love this pinup, by the way. It was my Superman pinup from Superman Gallery years ago. I love Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. He was a big influence on my, my art back then. Um, this is a big mistake a lot of creators make especially when they're breaking in. They look at who is getting hired and decide, well, 
you know, this is not a meritocracy. The companies hire all these bad creators. You know, I can do better than that. Well, you know what? You probably can. You probably can do better than that one piece you saw in that moment at that time that was created under those circumstances. You probably can. But even though all achievement in comics isn't about merit at the moment, you're not advancing your cause by looking at the worst that is out there and saying, well, I'm better than the worst out there. You need to be at your best and you need to be looking at the best and thinking about how to get there and stay there. Um, I, I will be the first to admit that a lot of success in comics can be about cronyism. I, 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 to this day, I, I'm not really in the loop with many creators. I live very far away from New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. I live in a tiny little town. I don't socialize that much. I miss out on a lot of the benefits of spending a lot of time with my bros in bars, but I still got a career anyway. And um, I've given you just about all the tips I can give you for uh, getting in and getting seen. And I hope it works for you. So uh, yeah, it is annoying when you see somebody you don't think is very good uh, excelling, but um, that can't be your focus. Your focus has to be on you and what you're doing. And uh, it's true. It's not entirely a meritocracy, but it's not entirely cronyism either. So move on. Um, this industry is something of a meat grinder, as I said. You don't always have the time or circumstances to do your very best. One of the hardest things to do is to create on demand. It's easy to create when you want to. It's easy to create when you feel good. But can you be creative when you have to be creative? Creating under pressure is what will determine whether or not you're able to make it as a pro. This is a very high pressure job. You will not only experience pressure from clients, you will experience it from the fan community. That for me lately has been even more difficult than editorial rejection. I remember when it was announced that I was gonna be working on the Vampire Diaries a lot of fans came forward and went, who is she? She's probably never seen the Vampire Diaries. She's just some corporate comics person. And, and they were really putting me down. And I was like, what are they talking about? I love the Vampire Diaries. I'm thrilled to get to work on this. Um, fandoms can be very gatekeepery, just as gatekeepery as the professional community. You need to be prepared. Now, afterward, our Vampire Diaries comic came out. People loved it. The fans were great. I was so grateful. It was super. But it can be really demoralizing before your work comes out. People dislike it even more than they dislike it after it comes out. It's very weird how that happens. And your ability to produce in, in this drama is, is gonna separate the women from the kiddies. You, you need to put on your big girl pants. Uh, um, you are going to have to endure some severe criticism and that's gonna determine whether or not you can handle the professional life. Publishers are watching how you take it. You need to behave like a professional all the time in your public spaces. This is one of my favorite jobs. This was for American Gods, uh, written by Neil Gaiman. Uh, I really love this job. And in my humble opinion, if you were to have pages like this in your portfolio, you would get publisher's attention simply because it shows some range. Um, having at least a half dozen pieces in your portfolio that uh, not only show action and adventure and drama, but domestic scenes. Can you just show people talking to one another, walking around, uh, interacting with each other like normal people? This is really important. And most of the time we never, never, never 
see it in your portfolio. So please try to have some of that in your portfolio. This is the kind of thing that's even going to benefit you more at book publishers than probably at Marvel and DC, but you want to have some of that in there. If you had this in your in your uh, pocket, you you're gonna you're gonna have more cash. Let me put it that way. Um, this is one of my favorite jobs. This is written by Gail Simone. It's from Wonder Woman's anniversary, and we got to introduce this super cute character called Star Blossom. This made me so happy, um, and it's it reminds me of how important it is to honor the work when you are given the responsibility of working on characters like Wonder Woman and Superman, they represent a lot of important things to many, many people. And it is important to remember that even though you have a private life and uh, personal opinions about things, um, you also have a responsibility to your client and to your audience. And you need to remember that you have to set an example. And being, um, being a mere human and not, uh, not a demigoddess like Wonder Woman, I'm gonna make mistakes, we're all gonna make mistakes, but I don't want to poison anyone else's joy. I want people to be able to sit down and read Wonder Woman and think of Wonder Woman and not think of some stupid thing I did. <laughs> So that is my philosophy. Your mileage may vary, but that's my advice. Another bit of advice is about branding your portfolio. Um, a lot of the advice I got when I was growing up, and this is also advice I got from Kelly Freeze, was to pick a style and stick to it. And I didn't do that. And it was one of the best things I ever did. My belief about my work is I want the work to be out front and I don't want to be there at all. I want to disappear into the work and I want to morph to become the person that is the right person for whatever job I sit down to do. If, if I were to compare it to acting, I would want to be the Daniel Day-Lewis of comics or Meryl Streep, I want to just completely disappear and be the tool behind the work and not a personality. Um, there are a lot of people that make great careers by being personalities. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I only want to make it about the art and I want the art to morph and change to reflect what is best for a particular assignment. And as you can see, the last two pieces don't even necessarily look like they're done by the same person. This is from my new book with Neil Gaiman called Chivalry. This is done in watercolor and colored ink. And as you saw from the last slide, completely different mediums and a very different look from job to job one thing that I often do is I try to completely destroy whatever I did before and build up something new onto the next next assignment and create a new look or learn some new skills. And this is a perfect example. I have wanted this story for 25 years when I finally got it, I sat down and cried, I was so happy. Um, this, this made me very, very happy. And I, I hope you'll look for it. This is uh, gonna be out from Dark Horse Comics in September. World building is super important. Um, this is some of my art for a project uh, called Reign of the Zodiac. It was talking about Keith Giffen earlier. Keith Giffen wrote that. And I absolutely love world building, creating uh, costumes and designs and uh, a look for an entire environment. This is one of my favorite things. So uh, there's a look at, at uh, some of the some of the complexity I bring to a project. And here's another page from that. This is uninked. Now, I usually complain about inkers. This is the last time I ever worked with an inker. This was inked by me and, well, mostly by Bob Wyacek, and it was also inked by me. Bob Wyacek was actually a fantastic 
fantastic anchor. I love working with him. Um, but penciling tight like this, I rarely do that anymore. But this is my uninked pencil. And if you look closely, you can see these little X's in here. That means I just want that filled in with black. But uh, uh, getting to do projects like this and, and complex uh, designs like this, this, this makes me very, very happy. It's my idea of a good day. And another change in style. This is from Tori Amos's um, uh, book, uh, uh, a short story called Pretty Good Year, written by Derek McCulloch. This is a unique technique I developed, which combined pencil art, handmade paper, and gold, uh, combined them digitally and did some final painting with digital. You can just barely see some of the some of the gold here in uh, some of these areas. Another style change, this is a look at my digital technique. On the left, the original pencil drawing and on the right, the uh, final art uh, digital. I, I'm not the most adept digital artist, I don't think. Uh, most, of my, most of my digital art ends up looking like hand-painted art, but that's exactly what I was going for here. Michael Whalen was uh, one of my favorite science fiction painters when I was growing up. And uh, I, I did this, this piece of art on the right in the style. This was my favorite novel when I was a kid. It was called The Silver Metal Lover. It's by Tanith Lee. And um, uh, so getting to do this, this uh, cover as an adult was a huge thrill. I love this book. Another stylistic change. This was a real challenge. Uh, this was for uh, Big Nemo. It was written by Alan Moore. We did this as a, an experimental animated webcomic. And in the, uh, the final, these pages moved and lit up and, and uh, it was really, really beautiful effects. I loved working on this. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done though. Woo. Another stylistic change. Uh, these are some cartoons of Black Canary and Catwoman. I keep saying I want to do a book in this style and I haven't done one yet. A look at my pen and ink art for Wonder Woman 750 uh, with more star blossom. Uh, this is all done by hand. Um, and I work really small. My original art is not standard comic book size. These, uh, these uh, pages are down on 11 by 14 paper some more pages from that job. And again, uh, this page on the right, you wanna make an editor happy. You need to have a couple of those in your portfolio, just normal, average, everyday domestic scenes. This is one of my favorite jobs of all time. This is from Snow Glass Apples by Neil Gaiman. I did the adaptation and art for this and uh, the digital color as well as the original hand-drawn pen and ink work. Uh, I worked in a, uh, well, I, I think it's innovative. <laughs> uh, storytelling technique where I minimalized uh, panel borders and used scenery and uh, other elements to divide the panels instead of borders because most of the story takes place in a character's head. Uh, I wanted to show it flowing and morphing as if they were thoughts instead of in panel borders as discrete units of time. You can see a little bit more of that here. I was quite happy with how this turned out. And a little bit more of that here. Uh, my inspiration for most of the art on this job was an Irish artist named Harry Clark. He was well known in the Irish arts and crafts movement. And I actually went to Ireland to photograph some of his originals. And then I sampled some of the color in these areas here and various spaces in the book so that the colors would match some of his illustration and stained glass work. I just put this in there because it makes me happy and it's fun. That's Harley Quinn. I get that for DC Women of Action. That was super fun. I love Harley. Uh, a look at uh, some of my technique. These are my thumbnails on the left and the finished art on the right. This is from Gone to America, a book about Irish immigration. This was again, a real technical challenge, not just from a draftsmanship standpoint, but from a research standpoint, I had to research three time periods in history and get everything right. I don't think we got a single thing 
incorrect, but boy, was it tough. But you can see how closely my uh, final art resembles the little layout over here. And another look at Gondo Marique. These are my pencils for a double page spread sequence showing three time periods on the shores of New York City, uh, 1860, 1960, and 2012. And the final pen and ink work. One of the things I noticed about this, Derek just pointed this out the writer the other day, the writer Derek McCulloch, we strangely picked three time periods in which the two towers aren't anywhere in any of the images. Feels was kind of empty. These are my original pencils from Disney's Beauty and the Beast. I uh, was surprised to find these in a file somewhere, but uh, another stylistic change, being able to, to nail these different looks for the client's needs is a real, real, really important. Um, some artists draw really well and some artists are stylists, but the better you draw, the more technical skills you have, the better your chances of, of longevity. Let me put it that way. And another page from Reign of the Zodiac with some of my designs. I think here you can really see uh, my influence from George Perez, one of my all-time favorite artists and one of my all-time favorite people, an absolute darling of a man. He has been so kind and good to me. Real advantage having somebody like him, like him on your side. Um, and he was one of the first creators I know who really, really pushed for women creators early on. Um, I, I've never forgotten his kindness and support. I love George. And some of my character designs. Uh, these are again from Marina the Zodiac. These, these have never been seen by the way. So uh, I'm kind of glad to get a chance to show you this. I hope I've been uh, helpful here. I hope I've been inspirational. This piece, by the way, was done for uh, the TV show Devs. You see a little, couple little clues down here in the art, but this is the end of my presentation.